Thanks, Katie. Uh, happy to, to do this. And uh, first want to thank NSF for the, uh, the support and also to acknowledge the, the many colleagues working on this project uh, with me. Uh, what I want to talk about today is really the role of engineered structures and services in supporting basic life safety, especially food and shelter during the response to this pandemic, and also to consider some of the implications of our initial observations for research and education, particularly in, in the fields represented by uh, the people you see here. The first example I want to consider is really the, the food supply chain. And uh, this is a, a critical infrastructure that is in a state of, of near collapse. And I, I don't think that's a dramatization of the situation. Uh, we're looking at a near term shortfall of about 8 billion meals in the United States, as well as uh, a drop in the number of volunteers and individual donations that, that normally come in. Um, I think one of the one of the real problems here is that we actually do have the supply, but because the, the demand on the other end isn't sufficient to pull that supply through. We're not getting enough food to enough people. Uh, grassroots organizations and uh, non-governmental organizations are trying desperately to adapt their, their way of working to, to meet this demand, but it's extremely difficult to do so. Uh, I think our main takeaway here is that it's we've really got to conclude that some of the assumptions about the resiliency that's supposed to characterize the system could potentially be very, very wrong. Uh, second, uh, again, uh, sort of moving away from food and now to, to where people live. Uh, lots of people do live in prisons. Uh, about 2.2 million Americans live in, in prisons these days. Uh, prisons have really proven to be sort of petri dishes of, of COVID transmission. Around 20% of the prison population is in the US is thought to be infected at the moment. Uh, one of the approaches that's been proposed is minimal, is a selective release of, of uh, nonviolent prisoners. And, uh, you know, that's been done to some extent, but really minimally. And, you know, re one thing that we can't do with uh, prisons is sort of redesign them for social distancing. So this is also an issue. On, in parallel, uh, there's sort of eerie parallels here to, uh, to the case of nursing homes. Again, about the same number of people um, in nursing homes and related facilities, 2.2 million, um, you know, limited visitation, limited movement. And as with prisons, outsiders are really the vector for infection. It's, it's worth noting, and this is sort of where the pandemic joint hazard element comes in, is that the risk mitigation guidance for COVID is really social distancing along with other measures, but this is directly at odds with what the risk mitigation guidance is for things like hurricanes, which we saw recently with Laura, which is congregation. Um, we're gonna see more of this and uh, more uh, sort of disagreements between risk mitigation policies as, as we go forward, pandemics aren't, aren't going anywhere. I think with both of these settings, uh, we really have to ask where are the opportunities for the residents of these facilities to adapt their behaviors in order to minimize risks to themselves and what kinds of tools are we providing for that? Um, I, I think it's probably no exaggeration to say that we are in the midst of probably the longest and most extensive reverse evacuation and shelter in place operation in human history. Um, but instead of leaving home for other spaces, we've really left other spaces for home and we really have no choice but to stay there. Um, as a result, if you if you lose your home, you not you lose not just a place to live, but potentially a place to, uh, to work and to learn. Um, so viewed from this perspective, you know, private homes are now critical. We, we need them in order to do the business of the country, learning and, and everything, but uh, you know, they're not supported as other so-called critical infrastructures are. Uh, Overall, I, I think what our work is, is bringing out is a, sort of two main sets of relationships. And you know, one is this, the first one between adaptation and criticality as society adapts to hazards, we find ourselves re reinventing our notions of, of what's, what's critical and, and vice versa. And within, as we consider this relationship, we've got to consider the extent to which these are infrastructures, our built environment, 
relates in realistic terms with, uh, with regulatory frameworks. Um, I want to conclude by saying that we feel that there's an, an urgent need not just to support research that will address these concerns, but really in the longer term, we maybe need to develop our own adaptive capacity as scholars and, and educators in order to learn from the errors that we've seen in the, in the past and respond to current challenges and shape the design of the future. Thank you.